have in assembling ourselves together here this morning for a period of Bible study and later for worship. We thank you for every precious soul that's here today. We thank you for the opportunity to worship and to study. And we pray that all that we do today will bring glory and honor to your name, that we will edify one another, and that we will have a more mature knowledge of, of your word. We're mindful of Sister Reasonover and Sister Kathy Arzadon. We pray that you'll bless them in their recovery. We pray for those who have connections with members here or family members of those who have lost loved ones. We pray that you'll bless them. We thank you for our families, for our physical families. We thank you for the spiritual family that we have here at East Hill. We pray your continued blessings upon us as we strive to Honor thee in word and in deed. Please be with us throughout this Bible study. Be with those in the back that teach our young ones. We're thankful for them, and we ask you to please bless us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Um, we're about ready to, uh, we, we are ready to begin uh, James chapter 3 after a couple of three weeks uh, due to uh, Brother Irby being here and then our Bible school, uh, vacation Bible school last week. If you think about it, uh, some people uh, carry instruments of life and death with them um, kind of in their daily uh, activities. That's a normal part of what they do. You think, for example, of a policeman who carries a deadly weapon with him or her to use uh, when appropriate. Um, a doctor carries powerful or at least has control over powerful drugs that have within them uh, matters of life and death. And both of these and many and others we could name, uh, others we could name, but all of these, both of these uh, types of individuals uh, must have a, a keen sense of responsibility uh, an urgent sense of responsibility as to how they use these things, whether it be a weapon or a, a drug or, or any other thing that we might come up with. Um, the book of Proverbs in uh, chapter 18, verse 21, says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So this chapter 3 that we're going to talk about this morning talks about the use of the tongue. Uh, some uh, translations have uh, the proper use of the, uh, or the use of the uncontrollable tongue sometimes. Um, the tongue is capable of great good. If you think about it, uh, Proverbs 15, 4, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Perverseness in it breaks the spirit. That same book of Proverbs in chapter 15, verse 23 says, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. We've all had, I suppose, at different times, different points in our life, someone to say a really encouraging word to us and how good that is. Sometimes just a, a word spoken uh, can bring great comfort. And by the same token, a word or a series of words wrongly spoken can bring great hurt. And so we have to measure carefully how we use those. Uh, the tongue is capable of great harm this led David to say in Psalms chapter 29, or 39, rather, verse 1, I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. Think of, just for a minute, think with me to words that we have either heard spoken or words that we have, we remember in, from the written form. Maybe we, we probably, most of us didn't hear these words uh, as they were originally spoken, but we've read them. And so a lot of these have had great impact on us. 
great impact on, on the people to whom they were, they were spoken. Think of these with me just a minute. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought, brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Abraham Lincoln. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Franklin Roosevelt. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Martin Luther King. Psalms chapter 19, verse 14 David wrote some of the words that we are all familiar with. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I remember uh, years, years ago when we uh, had prayer in public school, uh, when the individual classes, we, we always started our day with a Bible reading and prayer, and, and that was one of the prayers that was always led, quoted from David, let the words of my mouth. Powerful impact. Uh, I mention all of those because each one of us carries within ourselves, we wield, uh, yield and wield a powerful instrument of ourselves, ourselves. Uh, the tongue. We must certainly guard how we use it. We must certainly guard how we use it. Um, James chapter 3. James chapter 3 opens with a specific warning, a specific, very specific warning to Christian teachers and to those who aspire to be teachers. The opening statement there in verse 1 is not intended to discourage teachers in any way. That's not why James wrote it. Or it's, uh, or, or to, it's not written to cause Christians to waste the opportunities that they might have to teach. I think as we, uh, it, it rather it's intended to exhort teachers to do their work out of a pure motivation, pure motivation, and with careful restraint over what they say. As we go through, as we work our way through this chapter, and let's remember that we don't have to be standing before an audience, such as I am and many others in the back are this morning. That's not the only way we teach. And a lot of those other ways is what James is talking about as he gets further into this chapter. Uh, how we, uh, you know, uh, he just concluded, uh, we, we concluded chapter 2, and he talked about faith without works, words without deeds. And so here he's admonishing these people and us today to whom he was writing then to be careful as to how we, uh, how we use our influence whether it's public teaching or whether it's just us out in the, the world, we, we're to guard that. Um, because, of, because of the uh, influence that it has, there were dangers that could arise, certainly in the early church and in the church today, because of teaching for the wrong reason, teaching having the wrong desires. Uh, for one thing, a teacher could cause someone to be condemned by teaching those things that are false. False teachers, and the Bible warns of that repeatedly. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 12, I want to read that to you. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, the lie that comes from the false teaching, the false use or the, the improper use of, of the tongue. 
So teachers need to guard their words because of the influence they have. And James goes on to say in this chapter that teachers will be judged by a stricter standard than other Christians because of their much speaking. This means that they will judge by, be judged by people in this life and also by God in the final judgment. A teacher could also be guilty of distracting others from Christ. Romans 17, verse 18, Paul writes, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. All of that going back to, to words that are uttered. James chapter 3 is filled with many visual examples that James uses to admonish and teach and to encourage and to instruct those early Christians. Remember, these were the ones who had been scattered because of persecution. And I suppose it would, uh, well, I don't suppose, I know it would have been very easy for them to have, because of this persecution, to become angry, to become upset. Um, I, I, the whole time I was trying to prepare for this, I, I kept thinking and going back in my mind, I believe it, I looked this morning, it's, it's 239 in our, our song book. Angry words, oh, let them never from the tongue unbridled slip. May the heart's best impulse ever check them ere they saw the lips. Um, angry words are lightly spoken. Bitterest thoughts are rashly stirred. May the heart's best impulse ever keep them ere they saw the word. So there, there's a lot of teaching in that song. And uh, sometimes when we become upset with one another, we become upset with, with whomever. Uh, we need to think about that, that song. Um, the old, um, I don't know if this, uh, most of you are remember, know this uh, adage, uh, someone who is quick to fly off the handle. You heard the, ever heard that expression? You know, that, that, of course it had reference to a loose uh, ax head flying off a handle, but sometimes uh, when we use those words in a, in a proper, improper sense, uh, when we use our words in an improper way, uh, we could be guilty of flying off the handle, I suppose. So we need to, we need to be careful about that. Uh, but let me get back to the images. I got off the track there. Uh, James uses three or four powerful images in this chapter. And as you think about them, what he does is compare the smallness of something with the largeness of something, uh, or, how, or I better say how the smallness of something, the minuteness of something can affect, have a, a much greater impact on something. For example, bits in the bridle that are put in the horse's mouth. Uh, what a powerful influence they have over that huge animal. A small rudder that can control a great ship wheresoever the pilot wants it to go. The tongue is a little member in relationship to our physical body. And James talks about, behold how great a fire or how great a forest a little fire kindleth. We'll say more about that when we get to that chapter. But think in each one of those cases, something so small as a bit in a horse's mouth, a small rudder on a ship, a match or a spark that can ignite a huge forest. It hasn't been too many years ago uh, now that you remember over in the Sevierville, Gatlinburg area, how what destruction was brought about over there in that beautiful place. It even destroyed the church building, the, the church building over there um, that was something carelessly done. So James uses those images. Uh, he seems to have in mind how the sins of the tongue affect the owner of the tongue. That seems to be what James is stressing here. And there, there are different types of sins that are, that are linked to the improper use of the tongue. 
Some of these are sins against God, blasphemy, cursing, a sin of the tongue. Sins against others, sins against others created by improper use of the tongue, lying, bearing false witnesses, gossiping, tail bearing, backbiting. And you know, the, the scriptures warn of those who sow discord among the brethren. Very stern warning about that. And James is talking about that as well here. Sins against oneself, such as grievous words, corrupt words that are mentioned in Ephesians 4. Corrupt words that are re actually reveal one's heart, one's mind. Corrupt words. Or just too much talk sometimes. Proverbs 10, 19 in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. So think about those as we go through this. Chapter, uh, verse 1 of James chapter 3. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. You notice there that James includes himself in that when he says we, he's not just warning the teachers, but he includes himself. Um, most of us, most of, everyone in here can recall how influential teachers have been in our lives. That's certainly the case for me. Uh, I spent a great deal of my time around teachers. Um, some of the people that have influenced me the very most in my life have been teachers, Bible class teachers, high school teachers, college professors, great impact that those people and we as each other have because of our, our influence. You know, I'm happy that this congregation over the years has been blessed by many, many, many great Bible teachers. Think of what an influence that's been on all of us, the great teachers that we've had in this country. And not only that, but another thing I'm thankful for is that this congregation over the years has been blessed to have as members um, teachers, and, and some still are today, but in the past and today, teachers in our public schools who were faithful, faithful members here. And what a powerful impact that has. And we, we certainly ought to be thankful for the godly teachers that we've had, whether they're teachers that teach the word here, influence our young people, or whether they're teachers who are still out there on the front line uh, instructing our, our children uh, in school. So what's James saying here? What's he saying here when he says, let not many of you become teachers? Go back and think about chapter 2. Remember that James has taught that words without acts are worthless. Faith apart from works, James said, is dead. Uh, blessings are to be given to those who hear and do, and not to those who hear and do not was what he said in chapter 2. The meetings of the early Christians were for the most part open meetings, unstructured, informal meetings, where basically a lot of people were allowed to speak. Um, this led Paul to write in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation? has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edification. You know, that's one reason we come together. When we, that's, a, that's kind of a byproduct of our worship, I, I suppose. The edification we get just through our association with one another. And, and that's what Paul is writing about there. In verse 40 of that same chapter, Paul concludes, though, let all things be done decently and in order. 
It should be pointed out that earlier in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote in chapter 12, verse 28, and God has appointed these in the churches, first apostles, second prophet, prophets, and third teachers. So there's no doubt that the writers of the scriptures place great emphasis. And you remember uh, last week, uh, well, I lost... My train of thought. Who was the speaker, Joe? Brother, Brother Stevens. I had a senior moment there. Brother Stevens kept talking about how the, uh, the Jewish fathers, what a great uh, responsibility they had as, as teaching, teaching their children, teaching the law. So the teaching was very important. And Paul says that, that God has appointed those within the church. Great honor was given to the position of teaching in the church. Uh, some, if not many, of James's readers had come out of Judaism and were trying to graft the forms and ceremonies of the Mosaic Law upon the church. This, uh, one, of writings, uh, one of Paul's writings, again, in, in Romans chapter 2, verse 17, when he said, Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God. So they were trying to hold on to those uh, rituals and ceremonies of the Mosaic Law. So from this, it appears that many of the early converts had a desire for the attention that was brought to them through their teaching. It was an important position. James's warning against was the desire on the part of some who were unqualified and inexperienced to be teachers. You know, and going back to a, a, an example of just public school teachers, for example, you know, you don't just walk into a public school and, and start teaching. You, you go through an education process and then you go through an extensive practicum working under an experienced person who has been there. Those of you who have been classroom teachers, you've done that. Uh, Charlotte and Cecilia and Elizabeth and uh, maybe I've overlooked some that are here, but you all have all experienced that. You've, you've taken someone who is I used to hear the expression green behind the ears still, and you've molded them and you've helped them and you've instructed them. And so James is saying here, uh, don't get into it for the wrong reason. Don't do it with the wrong motives, but be prepared. And that's what we hope that we do uh, to our school teachers. And we better do it for our Bible class teachers and our, our uh, people that uh, proclaim the word. Teachers, through their words and their influence, can have a great impact on those that they instruct. Therefore, they needed to make sure that their preparation justified the position they were trying to fill. James was in no way, in no way, trying to discourage, discourage those who were qualified from teaching. In fact, it's the obligation of any of us to use the talents that God has blessed us with to do whatever we can in all areas that we can to carry out the work and the mission of the church. I think that was part of, uh, I certainly don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to use the parable of the talents to, to talk about how important it is for us to, to use the ability that we have for teaching. Um, the, the one that was condemned there in that parable that Jesus taught was not condemned because of the number of talents he had, but because of the failure to use it. And uh, turns out when the final analysis came, the one who did the least amount of work did the most talking. If you read that, that, uh, that parable of the talents, the one who had, had done the least uh, kind of did the most uh, objections to when, he, when the... Uh, final outcome came. Teaching is indeed basic to the continued existence of basic New Testament Christianity. What is condemned here by James is the self-appointed teacher who is trying to teach without proper study and preparation and certainly teaching for the wrong reason. It's worthy to note that James included himself in this warning by using the, person, by using the pronoun we. He included himself. Jesus himself, in warning his disciples about the scribes and the Pharisees, said in Matthew 23, 8, 
but you do not call uh, rabbi teacher, for one of your one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Again, this is a warning to those who are unqualified or who teach with improper motives. The Hebrews writer in chapter five, we are all familiar with this, verses twelve through fourteen, warned about spiritual immaturity when he wrote, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled, unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are a full age, that is, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. He's talking about maturity there. And that's what we do. Whether we're, you know, whether we're up standing before a, an audience, uh, it's, it's all about maturity, continued growth. And that's what James is trying to say. He's certainly not trying to discourage anyone from being a teacher. He's just saying, do it for the right reason. Don't do it for the notoriety that you might have thought you were getting from it. Uh, and do your very best, do your very best. Use the talent that you have and try to do the very best that you can. Uh, I suppose that's the reason he's telling the unprepared not to assume the position. Wait till you're, wait till you're ready. And he's not saying, well, just don't get ready, so therefore you won't ever have to step into that role. Uh, get yourself ready. Get yourself ready. Um, the word judgment that he used here when he says that they'll, they'll be uh, subjected to a, a stricter judgment, the word judgment here means condemnation. The consequences involved here in teaching that which is false or teaching that for which we are unprepared will lead them to answer to a stricter or heavier judgment. On the other side, on the other side of the coin, if the judgment is stricter, then so will the reward be. It will be greater for those who discharge the responsibility of teaching when it is done to edify, to instruct in the proper manner. And anyone who teaches, whether it be by word or deed, should take the responsibility carefully, take it carefully to heart when performing these duties, whether it's the public or whether it's just from our influence. Those teaching with their own motives, and living in hypocrisy need, James says, to stop teaching if they were doing it for the wrong reason. Any comment about verse 1? Anybody want to say anything about that verse? I've said about all I know to say about it. Right. Yeah, and and we we can't leave any of it out. Right. Yeah. Excuse me. Just. Yeah, that's that's certainly the case. Uh, certainly the case. Any other comment about that before we move to verse two? Please feel free to speak up. Even if you disagree, it's all right. You can be wrong. <laughs> Verse 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Um, the word stumble here denotes a lapse from that which is right. We might use the word trip. You know what, it, none of, all, how many of us have tripped over something in, in the past? Yeah, we, we all do that. I find as I get older, I do that more often. I trip more often than I used to and uh, stumble. We don't intend to do that. Nobody goes out and intends to stumble over something. We don't intend to do that. But as I say, we might use the word trip. Two things are pointed out here. We all stumble, and we all stumble in many things. The word is referring here to the mistakes we make, particularly where the use of the tongue is involved. We're not talking about a physical stumbling here. We're talking about stumbling when we use our tongue. 
because all stumble and make mistakes, a provision is needed for these sins. And we've alluded to this many times. Uh, 1 John 1, 7 through 9, we walk in the light. That's the provision that's made when we stumble. And uh, God certainly didn't leave us without hope there. We're not to suppose, however, that this stumbling is deliberate. Deliberate on our part. That is, we set out to sin for, for no such provision exists without, their, without true uh, repentance. So even though we've made, uh, there's provision made for our stumbling, uh, we're not to do it deliberately just so that, uh, what was it Paul said, it's how we continue in sin that grace may abound. God forbid. Uh, we don't do that. The faithful Christian often stumbles or trips on sins which are in his path. But we do not deliberately stumble. When James uses the phrase stumble in word, he is referring to the proper use of the tongue. Although verse 1 is directed to teachers, in verse 1, he broadens the concept in verse 2 to include all of us. We all stumble. Teachers especially needed this instruction because of their much speaking. However, we're all included in his instructions as to how we properly use our tongue. We all use our tongue, so therefore we have opportunity to stumble. The one who stumbles not in word is one who has reached maturity in spiritual growth. And that's what we're striving for. Will we ever get fully there? No, I suppose not. But we keep striving. The word does not denote sinlessness, but rather mature growth. We're all prone to use our tongues improperly at times, to, sing, to say things that we ought not to say. We've all done that. We've all, we're all guilty. I'm certainly guilty of that. Saying things sometimes, you know, you've heard the uh, old phrase, uh, be sure you put your brain in gear before you put your mouth in motion. That's certainly what he's, what he's talking about. If someone is able to so control the tongue so as to not use it improperly, and this takes great maturity, it could be said of such a person that he is able to bridle, to keep under rein his whole body. Remember how the tongue controls our whole body. The whole body is used here to designate the sum of all the sins of which man is capable, every sin of which man is capable. The figure of the bridle here is an important term because the one who has control of the bridle has control of the horse, just as the one who controls the tongue is able to keep the whole body in check. Behold, we put bits in horse's mouth that we, horse's mouth that we may control the whole body. And so we have to control the whole body by controlling the tongue. So verses, any comment about that? Anybody? Well, about how many, Steve? A lot of opportunities to trip there, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and you know, sometimes, I, I, sometimes we, don't mean, we don't intend that by any means. And sometimes it's, most of the time it, uh, it's not intended. Sometimes it is, but most of the time I, I can recall an occasion where uh, a man said something to me one time. Uh, it uh, was... Uh, he meant it, he meant it absolutely with a pure heart. He had no ill will when he said it to me, but it was, it, uh, it really hurt me when he said that because of the time when it was said, but he had no intention of, of hurting me. I know he didn't. I, I know, I knew the man. He, he was a good man. So we have to be careful about that. Sometimes in those much speaking, we can, uh, we can say things that hurt others. But, uh, so we, that's why I think James devotes this whole, whole chapter to that. But we have to be careful in using those 4,800 words that we speak. Uh, verses, uh, verses 3 and 4, these kind of go together. Uh, Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Wherever the pilot desires. In these two verses, these two verses, James uses a spirited animal 
and an inanimate object or an illustration, one that all these readers would have been, that we are familiar with. This is a classic example of using something that his readers are familiar with to make a special point. You know, that's much like what Jesus did in the parables. You know, the greatest teaching is done when we can put it down on the level of those to whom we're speaking. That's really what makes a good teacher, being able to reach the audience. And that's what he, he's using illustrations here, uh, much like uh, Christ did. A horse, though it be quite large, is easily controlled by a small bridle. The bridle is used to control and turn the whole body of the horse, just as the rudder is used by the pilot of the ship to turn the whole ship. The will of the horse and the fierce winds on the sea are both, in effect, controlled by a very small object. Of course, he's talking there of probably a sailing vessel. The lesson here is that if we can control a large animal, such as a horse, by using a small bridle, and if we can control a large ship by a small rudder, then we ought to be able to control the whole body by controlling the tongue. Control the whole body by controlling the tongue. Because the tongue is so powerful, a person must, along with other parts of the body, bring it under control. Look at uh, Romans chapter 6 with me just a minute. Romans chapter 6, I believe it's verse... Uh, yeah, verse 13 and 14. And put this in the context maybe of thinking about the, the use of the tongue. Romans 6, 13 and 14. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Paul's writing there. Verse 5. Even so, even so, he's talked about these ships. He's talked about this horse. Even so, the tongue is a little member. The tongue is like the bridle, uh, the, the bit he's comparing it to, like the rudder. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. The contrast here is between the small size of the tongue and the largeness of the body, the physical body. A third illustration that James uses here is the small fire and the great forest that is destroyed by the fire. The vast difference shown here is in the cause and the effect. The effect of the little fire and the resulting destruction is uncontrolled. How many of you remember the uh, forestry, I, I think it's the forestry service, using, I don't see these anymore, uh, the Smokey the Bear advertisements. Y'all remember those? Yeah. How'd those always end? Remember how, remember only what, only you can prevent forest fires. That's how they ended. Uh, how can I control, how can I control my body by controlling my tongue? I think that's what, uh, that's what James is saying. Um, Brother Woods, um, uh, in his commentary, um, says that that backbiting with the tongue is one of the most common sins that's committed, backbiting. What is that? Talking behind somebody's back. That's what backbiting is. You know, whispering, talking to, pulling somebody else off to the side and talking about somebody else behind their back. Uh, David asked Psalm chapter 15, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? And he answers this. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does, does not backbite with his tongue. As I said, to backbite is to talk behind someone's back. 
It's an Anglo-Saxon term denoting knavery, a, a low-born person, uh, a coward, brutality, insensibility, insensible to the feelings of others. That's what backbiting is. In the Hebrew, he who backbite with who he who backbite with the tongue is he foots not upon his tongue. He does not kick about as someone who would kick a football. He does not kick about the character of an absent person. He does not go behind the back and talk about that. Uh, you know, it's, it's virtually impossible to counteract or to forget the effects of slander and malicious gossip. Wrong use of the tongue. Proverbs 26, 20, where there is no wood, what happens? The fire goes out. And where there is no tail bear, the strife ceases. I think that's one reason that the uh, Bible talks about so much about those who would sow, sow discord among the brethren, the improper use of the tongue. Any comment? Anything anybody wants to say? We've got a few more minutes. We'll look at verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. Verse 6 of that chapter. In the previous verse, James has shown the reader the devastating effects of fire when it ranges out of control. We've all seen those images, in, particularly in California and out west in the dry seasons, how much destruction those fires can do. Uh, he then shows that the tongue is like a fire in the pain that it inflicts, in the destruction of relationships which it affects, and the effects that follow the improper use. As I said, sometimes those linger and are never really forgotten. Among all the members of the body, the tongue, when improperly used, is the most destructive of all the members. The phrase, world of iniquity, that he uses there in verse 6, is an expression designed to in indicate the sum of all the evil that the tongue can cause due to its great power, a world of iniquity, encompassing everything that we do. It's impossible to measure in this life the harm which grows out of slander, out of profanity, out of lies, blasphemy, and scandal, all produced by the power of the tongue. It defiles, the, word, the, the phrase it defiles, meaning to stain or to spot the whole body. You get a spot on a cloth. It stains the whole cloth, stains the whole body. The course of nature here is the wheel of nature in other translations, the course of nature. The literal meaning of the Greek here is the, is the wheel of existence or the whole round of human life and activity, the whole realm of human life. This could have reference to a man's nature, which is often inflamed and kindled into the most outrageous wickedness by the tongue. The fire which results from the tongue is then compared only to that which arises in hell, in Gehenna. The term Gehenna was the name of the valley just outside the, the city of Jerusalem where the children of Israel practiced the idolatrous rites of Molech, where the children of Israel sacrificed their own children to the fire god Moloch. It's interesting to note that the fire, which figuratively comes from our tongue, originates in hell and will eventually lead one who uses the tongue improperly to hell. Brother Woods made the comment, the statement that one should never throw mud because while one may miss the target thrown at, he will always wind up with dirty hands. Always wind up with dirty hands. 